One of the greatest joys of my life has been the privilege of being a granddad. Having had three granddaughters, one of the key things I have learned, sorry, having, having had three daughters, one of the key things I have learned is to help them develop their identity, who they are, and why. When you think about it, we develop our sense of identity in many ways, sometimes consciously and other times subconsciously. With my eldest granddaughter, I have three questions, three statements that I say to her. I see her three, four, five, six, seven, eight times a week. And I, nearly every time I see her, I will go through these first one. The first one is this team, to which she say, always stick together, always one. And then it's, who are you? I usually look in her eye at that point. Granddad's special girl. Then lastly, granddad. And the answer is, always on my side. <laughs> the God of the Bible does a similar thing for each of us if we are his children. The book that we've been looking at in the last few weeks does it brilliantly. In fact, you could say, you could apply the same questions I asked my granddaughter to your and my relationship with God. First of all, team. Look at 12 verse 1. What's the team? All of God's people. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. If you're a Christian here tonight, you are one of God's people and you are not alone. All those who have died before you, it's a little bit like the London Marathon. They are there and they're screaming and they're encouraging you. They finished the race, you're in it. And then secondly, who are you? Look at chapter 10, verse 22. You are God's forgiven child. Your heart has been sprinkled to cleanse you from a guilty conscience. If you're a Christian, you stand before God, what? Complete, forgiven through the death of the Lord Jesus. He's taken the punishment for your sin on the cross. He's made you clean covered you with the perfect completeness of his son, the Lord Jesus. Third question, not granddad, but God, 11 verse 16. Not ashamed to be called your God. Always, always on your side. Now when I say it to my granddaughter, it's to help her know her identity, where she belongs, who's there to defend her. As Christians, it's the same. God wants you to know who you are, your identity, that he is your loving father there to defend you. God gives us names to remind us of his love and his care. But he also gives us names that remind us of a different thing, a different truth, a different reality, as we see in the life of Abraham and the life of Sarah. You see, the first point is faith your identity. As that passage was read by Ruel, did you notice how Abraham, and Sarah, how Abraham and Sarah are described from the passage that Ruel read? Just look again at verse 9. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign land. Look at verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. I wonder, as you hear those words, what thoughts, what emotions come into your mind and your heart when you hear the word foreigner, stranger? For some of us, which I include myself, the reality of the, these two words is not, our, is not my daily experience. But for others, it very much is. When my wife first started her nursing career, it was in the leafy suburbs of Surbiton, just about 15 miles away from here, where she grew up. She was a district nurse, therefore visited and cared for people in their homes. And one of the questions she was regularly asked was, and she came into the home. So where are your people from? To which my wife would reply, oh, Serpenton. 
Then the quick reply would be, oh, but where are your people really from? Because of the colour of her skin, the feeling she was given was, you are not one of us, therefore you don't really belong. And many of you, sadly, will have the same daily experience. She had it just because of the colour of her skin. You feel like a stranger. You don't really belong here. You are not one of, you're not one of us. Now, it's, just not, it's not just in the issue of ethnicity and race. It can, be in, it can be in class, both up and down. The feeling that you're not one of us, that you don't really belong here. Now, the writer of the Hebrews is saying, as a Christian, that is how you should feel. Not because of your own ethnicity or class, but because of your identity as a Christian. In this world, your daily experience should be feeling that you are different. Not because you're better, not because you're superior to anybody else, but because you are a follower of Jesus. Because you're someone who loves him. Therefore, you always put what he says first. He's number one. He's number one when it comes to making decisions about how you spend your money. He's number one in how you, how you make decisions in life. He's number one in how you approach your studies, young people, or your work. I was chatting to a young person recently about their exams, and I quoted my dear mum, who used to say, all you can do is your best. Do that, and then don't worry. And I said to the young person, concern yourself with doing your best and then just let the results look after themselves. There's no more you can do than your best. And the really sad thing was that the young person looked back at me as if I'd come off a different planet. And it was sad. Different than the way we approach our exams, both as parents and as young people. Number one in how we relate to your body. Jesus is number one when it comes to sex. Jesus is number one when it comes to alcohol. In a world where individuals choose to make their own rules and reject God's, a person who loves Jesus should feel like a stranger. We should feel as if we don't belong. In a world where individuals choose to make their own rules and reject God, we should feel like strangers. But that's not the only title and name Abraham and Sarah are given. Just look down at verse 9. What else are they? They are heirs with him of the same promise. Abraham and Sarah, you and me, if we're followers of Jesus, we are heirs of God's promise. What does that mean? What it means is all of God's promises, every single promise that he's given in his word, both Old and New Testament, every single promise he has given is, is ours. It's Abraham and Sarah's, it's yours and mine. See, one of the ways as human beings we show our love is to to make promises. It's at the heart of of a marriage ceremony, two people committing themselves to each other by making promises. And the reason we value promises and desire to keep them is because we reflect God's character. He loves. He loves, so he makes promises. He loves, so he keeps those promises. Hebrews 11 introduces us, and this is the big thing I really want you to get tonight. It introduces us to an unavoidable tension. Two truths that we've got to hold together. It's not a 50-50, it's a tension. God's promise is in one hand, and the reality of living as a stranger in the other. That's the tension that Hebrews 11 introduces us to. God's promise is in one hand, living as a stranger in the other. So, Abraham and Sarah, how do they model that? Faith, second point, faith, your certainty. Now, if you don't know anything about Abraham and Sarah, let me give you a little, uh, little bio. They are the fir- they're in the first part of the Bible called the Old Testament, and actually the first book of the Old Testament called Genesis. When you get to the New Testament, along with Moses, Abraham is probably the greatest character and most mentioned person from the Old Testament. In today's lingo, he would be called a ledge. 
The nickname the New Testament gives him is Father of Faith, which means the guy who teaches you and me how to trust God. Or to put it in Hebrews 11 language, the guy who teaches us how to be a stranger whilst holding on to the promises of God. So let's get into the story of Abraham and Sarah. The story begins, look at chapter 11, verse 8. The story begins with a command. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to the place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. God commands Abraham and Sarah to get up and to go, to go on a very, very long journey. But he commands them to go without what? What have they not got? Get up and go, God says, but what has he not got? He's not got a map. Now, that is a problem, isn't it? Today, it would be like God telling you to get up and go, but leave your phone and your sat-nav behind. Now, how are they going to respond? How, I wonder, would you respond to that? And then God calls him to, verse 9, live in tents. Now, I don't know how you, the thought of living in tents thrills you. Just a few uh, weeks ago, Rico, one of the, one of the, on the staff here, one of the ministers here, he said, Trev, do you like camping while on holiday? And my answer, to be honest, was no. No, I don't. When I go on holiday, I like to feel a little bit more comfortable, not less. But that's probably, I'm just probably a bit soft. For Abraham, the command is simple. Leave your home without a map and live in tents. But that's not the biggest challenge he faces. Sarah, who in verse 11 is described, how is she described in verse 11? Just look down. How is she described in verse 11 as past the age of childbearing? Which if you look in the book of Genesis, you think, absolutely right she is. She's 90 years old. Past it? You bet she's past it. And Abraham, how's he described? Well, again, you look back in Genesis. Well, look at, look, sorry, look at verse 12 of Genesis, uh, Hebrews 11 first. How's he described? And so from this one man, and he as good as dead. Which again, when you read Genesis, you find out he's 100. Yeah, he's as good as dead. Two old, lifeless bodies. God says, we'll give life. That's what God is asking them to believe. And then he kind of makes it even bigger. Look at verse 11. Sorry, chapter 11, verse 2. And their descendants will be what? As numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Now, if Abraham and Sarah are to judge reality by what they see, What are they going to do? What are they going to do? No map, living in tents, two lifeless bodies. To the eye, it seems crazy. Absolutely out of your mind. What do you think the neighbours said when the for sale sign came outside of his house? I think the neighbour might have said something like this. All right, Abe? Where are you off to then? New job? Promotion? No, actually, we're uh, we're taking God at his word and we're leaving. Oh, okay. And where's that then? Oh, we're we're not quite sure yet. Sorry? Not sure? A God you can't see has called you to a place you can't see Sounds like pie in the sky to me, Abe. And by the way, aren't you a bit too old for that? Abraham's initial response might have been, well, they can see the for sale sign. I'm jolly glad they can't see the maternity bag packed up inside. I'm just glad they can't see that. Yet here's Abraham and Sarah teaching us how to hold onto God's commands and promises while feeling like a stranger, trusting in a God who says, I will guide you to a great land for your people to live in. I will, I will bring your life, I will bring life out of your lifeless bodies. 
Now, just ponder for a second what Abraham already knows of God's character. Just look back to chapter 11, verse 3. What does he know of God's character already? We know that he knows that God is almighty creator. He creates the world just by speaking. He knows, verses 4 and 5, that he welcomes those who trust in him. Verse 7, we know that he knows that God judges the world, sorry, God judges those who rebel against him. So Abraham and Sarah, what do they do? With this challenge from God, what do they do? They line up the commands to leave their home and go to a distant land without a map with the reality of God as their creator. Look, if God can wake the sun up to create the morning and then put it to bed every evening, then it's probably a good thing to trust God's word and not the neighbor, don't you think? Which is what he does, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to the place he would, he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went. Abraham and Sarah choose to line up God's character alongside the ridicule from their neighbors. If God can create the world when he wants and then judge the world when he wants through a flood, Whose words? Whose words are you going to obey? Whose words are you going to take seriously? The creator or the created? And as Abraham and Sarah choose to trust their creator, what does God do? And again, something new I've seen in the chapter this week, and it's wonderful. As they step out and obey... What does God the creator do? God kind of draws back the curtain then to show Abraham and Sarah even a bigger reality. He's not merely going to give them a home here on earth, but he's going to give them an eternal home. Look at verse 10. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder was God. When Abraham and Sarah hear the promises of life to their lifeless bodies. They again drag their doubts to the character of God. Verse 11, she considered him faithful who had made the promise. I think, I think that the kind of words are like this. That every, every time Abraham and Sarah trust God in their immediate reality, no map, lifeless bodies, they trust him for the immediate reality, and then what that does is it drives them forward to trust him in a further reality, eternity. And I think that's exactly the same for us. You trust God with the immediate reality, then he takes your eyes off that, and then he helps you to see the eternal reality. And then lastly, faith, your responsibility. You see, as we look at Abraham and Sarah, God calls us to follow in their footsteps. He calls us to live lives with that tension. In one hand, we have the commands and promises of God. In the other hand, we live as strangers. When Abraham and Sarah got stick from their neighbors, what are they left with? When you get stick from your work colleagues or your mates at school or your friends, what are you left with? You're left with a choice. And that's what they do. Look at verse 13. Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. The choice for them, the choice for us is clear. A life of holding things in tension God's promises in one hand and living like a stranger in the other. Living like a stranger or rejecting God and fitting in. That was their choice. That's my choice. That's your choice. You see, I don't know the challenges you face. 
I don't know what at the moment is attacking your trust in God. It could be that following Christ, being faithful to his word, puts you on a collision course with your boss, with your colleagues at work, which leads to you feeling like a stranger, stranger in the staff room, stranger in the boardroom, same stranger in every room. Or you may feel like you're locked into an unhappy marriage where every morning is a challenge and you would rather just stay asleep. You may be the only Christian in your family and every day you feel like a stranger. Or maybe every day you hear the news about the cost of living crisis and you take a really deep breath. You think of the energy bills coming in and what is currently in your bank balance and what's coming in and miles apart. They're just some of the challenges that people here may be going through, and I'm sure there's many, many more. I'm sure what you, the question you want to think about is, how do we follow Abraham and Sarah today in 2022? Let me return to the three question statements I, will ask, I asked my granddaughter, and with these we'll close. And apply them to Hebrews. Team, well, that's all of God's people since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, I'm going to give you a contradiction. Here's a contradiction. You'll never be a successful stranger on your own. What do I mean? We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses in heaven, but sadly, their voices are often drowned out by the world. So what do you, what do I need here on earth Well, look at chapter 10, verses 24 to 25. This is what you, this is what I need. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day approaching. If we are to survive as strangers in our workplace, our home, our sports club, we need each other. We need fellow strangers. It's nearly impossible to remain godly in a world that rejects God without each other. That's why meeting together in person on a Sunday is so vital. That's why we have got to move on from watching church on a telly. That's why fellowship groups are so important. Their purpose is to help each other live like Jesus in a world that doesn't know him to talk about our saviour together. Remember hearing a true story. It was a church in London, quite a well-known church, and they'd had this African pastor stay with them for three months, and at the end of the three months, uh, the pastor interviewed him, and they said lots of different things, and they finished with one final question. They said, what's been one of the major differences between your country and ours? And the African pastor said this, you never seem to talk about heaven. Why do you think that was? Why do you think that is? When was the last time you had a conversation with a fellow Christian about heaven? Secondly, who are you? Well, you're a person... You and me are a person with a map in our hands. What do I mean? Unlike Abraham and Sarah, we do know where we are going because we have the reality of the Lord Jesus. Just turn back to chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Everything about these words in verses 1 to 3 are a description of a relationship of deep, deep love. As a Christian... What's your responsibility? Verse 1, your responsibility is to run. Your responsibility is, verse 1, to persevere. Your responsibility, verse 2, is to fix your eyes. Your responsibility, verse 3, is to consider. That's your responsibility. How are you 
going to succeed as being a stranger in this world. You're to run, you're to persevere, you're to fix your gaze, you're to consider. Who are, to you, who are you to run after? Who are you to persevere with? Who are you to fix your gaze on? Who are you to spend your time considering? You're to run after Christ. You're to persevere in your relationship with Christ. You're to fix your eyes on the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. You're to fix your gaze. You're to consider the greatest stranger of all who endured such vicious opposition from sinners. Those words are some of the most meaningful words that describe a relationship of deep love. We all run after the person we most love. It's the sign that you're in love. It's a sign that you're falling in love, that you run after them. And a love, rela- and a, and a love relationship is all about persevering, isn't it? When you love someone, however hard that relationship may be, you love them so you persevere. The person has won your heart. They've won your love. They've won your affection, so you persevere in running after them, whatever the cost. With the young people at the moment, we're doing the story of David. And we're looking and we're learning that the way to understand the story of David, one of the ways is you understand that the way to love Christ is how Jonathan loves David. And when Jonathan has to leave his father because he realizes that David is the anointed one and his father hates David, he says to David, I will do anything for you. Anything. I'll even leave my father. I'll even die for you. Because he loved him. And that's the same for us. We run after him. We run after Christ. We persevere in our relationship. Now, is that how you see and experience your relationship with Christ? The best thing you can do is to enjoy considering him. The best thing you can do is fix your gaze on the one you love. For he is the most beautiful thing. For when we run, for when we persevere, when we fix and consider him, what happens? Whatever we face, however alienated you may feel, however deeply you feel like a stranger, When you fix your gaze on him, what happens? When we follow the map and we see where it ends, verse 3, the right hand of the throne of God, which is where he is. When we fix our gaze on him, Jesus, the one who is our map, the one who is our motivation, the one who is our destination, the one who is our everything, when we fix our gaze on him, what do, we not, what do we not lose? We don't lose heart. The only way not to lose heart is to gaze on him, is to consider him, his, his beauty. Therefore, when a Christian brother or sister is losing heart, what do you remind them of? You don't tell them to just keep going. You, you t- try and help them to gaze on him. I asked you the question, when was the last time you talked about heaven with a fellow Christian? When was the last time you talked to a fellow Christian about the beauty and the brilliance of the Lord Jesus? Something you've seen in his word about just how brilliant he is. 
When was the last time you shared that? And overflowed from your heart, from your life with a fellow Christian who maybe was struggling. And when we follow him, heaven's perfect stranger, then, not thankfully granddad always on your side, but 11 verse 16, God always on your side. For he is not ashamed to be called your God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we realize that following you, being a stranger, is hard, it's tough. But we thank you for the one whose footsteps we travel in. Not Abraham and Sarah, but our wonderful Savior. Father, help us to be taken up with him. Help us to learn to enjoy fixing our gaze on him. To consider him. And to do that with each other. And to enjoy doing that with each other. Help us to do that. And Father, I pray that if, they, if all of this seems incredibly strange to anybody here, I pray that through your spirit today, they would come to know the Lord Jesus as their saviour. In Jesus' name. Amen.